So my understanding is um, that actually in the, the very uh, foundation stages of the um, rebuilding macroeconomics, there are a couple of workshops on what's needed doing, and there was a sense of, yeah, we, we know there's, there's issues obviously around financial stability and institutions and so forth. Um, but along the way, people said, well, what about all of this sustainability stuff? What has economics actually got to, to say about it and macro, and does it have macro dimensions? And from that, there was a decision to have a hub on sustainability. Um, and um, Tiago and I got together and put in a proposal about how we saw some of those linkages might, might occur. Um, and um, I hope that by the end of the session, you'll decide, you know, it was a good decision to have a hub on sustainability and can draw some conclusions about where and how this area would relate to, shall we say, the wider and more mainstream tasks of rebuilding macroeconomics. Um, now, this is, I've, I've actually got pulled out two quotes and uh, this will look like I'm really on top of the CEPR website to pick up something from two days ago. Mm. Uh, I actually have to thank Angus for emailing it to me, um, which is a comment published two days ago from, from Andrew Oswald and Nick Stern. I guess many of you will know them. And it basically says, why is the economics community letting down the world on climate change? Um, and um, it's in pretty blunt language uh, in that, if you look at it. Uh, that particular piece was more focused on the extent to which uh, what, what he describes as the greatest, one of the greatest issues of our age uh, doesn't even appear in some of the, the top economics journals. Um, but those who know, certainly Nick's piece, he's also been rather strong in critiquing on when stuff has appeared, how this line is some of it. Um, there was another one that I, I came across from uh, INET, uh, the Institute of New Economic Thinking, with a sort of similar tone in a way, except to say that in their ways in which economics is actually blocking progress on this issue, which was a pretty, uh, again, strong accusation to, to levy. I'm not going to read out the quotes, you can have a look. But, but I, I mean, against that background, frankly, Congratulations to Angus uh, and others for deciding they needed to be a hub on sustainability, leaving a fairly open agenda as to what we think that would evolve. Now, I know uh, on both of these, uh, there is an eternal risk in this field. It seems that one tries to talk about sustainability and ends up talking about climate change uh, and energy. Obviously, there are many other dimensions to sustainability. Um, the extent to which we've captured some of that we'll see in the projects covered. Um, but it's also the interaction between sustainability and the entire energy system, and energy is a key input. I mean, as, as we all know, economic systems couldn't function without energy, and there's a long debate about substitutability and so forth. And uh, in a moment, Steve King will, will kick us off in, in that area. Um, but just uh, before that, again, a couple of scene setting thoughts and questions that have come into my mind periodically as we've gone uh, in putting this, this HUMPS program together. And there are questions about to what extent actually is this going to be a recipient of rebuilding macro? That first session was absolutely fascinating, and bits of my neurons were firing and thinking, oh, that could be quite interesting to apply. Because, you know, this is an area that's hugely about expectations and lots of, lots of other aspects about how we think the economy is going to work in, in the future and the extent to which carbon will be constrained. Um, is it going to be a direct contributor? Will we uncover things by looking at these areas which say, well, actually, guys, mainstream rebuilding macroeconomists out there, by thinking about that, uh, actually, we've got a completely different way of thinking about macroeconomics because we're thinking very long term, almost by definition, and sort of externality type issues, if that is even the right word. Or is it just as an almost alternative? Um, was put to me by Eric Beinhocker, I guess many of you know, which was quite a lot of the stuff going on, uh, sort of the more you know, radical edge, dynamic economics, evolutionary economics, etc., has actually been around for quite a long time in one way or another. But if you look at the history of ideas, 
Often ideas have indeed been developed for decades and they finally start to dominate because there's a problem which absolutely demands those new ways of thinking. And in that sense, maybe sustainability is a kind of mega case study for some of the things that the, the, the rest of the programme is looking at. But just one anecdote, and then I'll, I'll just put up this, the uh, that he's going to be speaking, um, which I think shows some of the interrelations here. There is a narrative, possibly the dominant narrative, uh, in the interface of finance and climate change in particular, which says the problem is the lack of transparency. We had this disastrous financial crisis a decade ago because people didn't really understand the risks they were holding and couldn't trace them, and that's what led to the crash. And to some extent, sort of the Mark Carney Plus uh, narrative is the same as the problem with climate change. Actually, there's an existential risk, and no one in the financial system actually knows what's the carbon intensity of the portfolio that they're holding. And if we solve that and we have transparency, then actually the system will do what it, what it should do. And, and I, I called up a, a colleague of mine who's from the finance sector, unlike mine, a fellow called Perry Merlin, um, and said, you know, what do you think of this, that finance, that transparency will solve it? Because a lot of people in Europe are really excited. We get full transparency and hate that the system will solve. And he said, well, that's not going to work. He said, Okay, interesting. Why? I said, well, first thing is, quite a lot of the US financial community watch Fox News and they don't really think climate's a problem anyway. Uh, second, they see no evidence that even if it's a problem that the US government is ever going to do anything about it, so why should they worry? Third, they, they have a collective problem, which is even if they think something might be done by the government in the future, then they lose their shirts if they move first before the market moves, because what matters is not whether the market's rational, but whether you're deviating from its expectations. Fourth, if all of the above is wrong, then we've got um, carbon capture and storage. We hear bits and pieces about sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, so our carbon assets are safe. And fifth, even if all of the above is wrong, well, we're so big governments will just have to come and bail us out when the crunch comes. I thought, bloody hell. Talk about expectations and management. You know, in effect, the field of climate change is now one mega battle over shaping expectations about whether or not governments are going to actually be capable of doing something really serious in a timely manner, which will devastate the asset value of those who've held on to fossil fuel reserves for too long, with all kinds of potential consequences if that is an unstable uh, shape now, which will be the, uh, the top of the final presentation. So those are just sort of introductory <coughs> thoughts um, we've got four uh, projects uh, under this uh, hub. Um, Steve Keane will talk in a moment. Many of you will, will know Steve. I'll, I'll leave Steve to, to obviously run through uh, the fascinating stuff he's bringing to this, this table from pretty fundamental ways. Um, we, we, I'll be pretty transparent about this, but I think it shows one of the great things about this rebuilding macro program. We had quite a dilemma because there were two projects proposed that involved agent-based modelling and so forth uh, in relation to sustainability and, and asset risks and finance, etc. And we're struggling and had debates about which one should we go for. And eventually we said, do you know what, we're just going to basically shove them together. And uh, so Tim and Tim got together um, with some fairly substantial prodding and shaping out a great project uh, between them. So we have Tim Jackson here to, to present that one. Uh, and then we'll, we'll finish uh, with Tim, uh, sorry, Jean-Francois Mercure uh, presenting. I think Andrew Jarvis is also in the room, which is starting to impart zero in upon the stranded assets type uh, risks and dynamics thereof. Um, you may have noticed the gender balance on this uh, topic is not very good. I guess the same, unfortunately, too true in much of the room here. Um, I'm, you know, that's another reason to be pleased that actually we do now have a fourth uh, project, uh, which is by Marian Dumas, uh, London School of Economics, just, just agreed, which is on the role of green product differentiation. Um, and its dynamics in shaping the role of consumers in transforming uh, sectors and whether or not uh, new demand sources, green consumption, can transform uh, sectors. 
Uh, Marion couldn't be here, not least because uh, actually a little bit like Jane Swinson, um, she's uh, got one year old, uh, yet less than one year old baby. Um, but hopefully we'll be seeing more of her on this hub as that, that project gets going uh, and starts to integrate that. Thank you.